uh, by Vincent Warmerdam. Uh, so hi everyone, thanks for having me over. Y buenos dias, me gusta estar en Bilbao. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about the joy of simulation. Uh, my name is Vincent, I'm from Amsterdam. And what we're going to do in the beginning uh, is I need you guys to get out your laptops and go to this one website. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, what we're going to discuss today is what randomness is and what it isn't. Then I'm going to explain to you guys how sampling can actually be used to, you know, do a bit of inference, which is nice. I will then demonstrate a couple of experiments that I've done with sampling. So I'm going to explain to you how I derived some better tactics for Monopoly using simulation. I will explain to you how I found out that you can sell Legos on, uh, Lego minifigures on eBay for a bit of profit. Um, I'm going to then talk about how sampling can be used as an optimization tactic. And I'll conclude by talking about how we can outsource creativity a bit by using sampling. And then I'll talk about some Pokemon related subject, which somehow blends everything together. So. Uh, randomness. Before talking about what randomness is, because we're going to be sampling, uh, we should be sure that we understand what randomness isn't. Uh, because, you know, we're humans and computers nowadays tend to be a little bit better at understanding randomness than we are. So if you could all please go uh, to the website that I've just told you about, and we're going to go ahead and do a bit of an inverse Turing test. So this would be the website, this would be my blog, and then there's this one uh, blog post called Human Entropy. Please go there right now. And you should see a website that's somewhat similar to this. And you could read it, but the idea is we're going to go ahead and try to generate random numbers. So put your index finger on the one, put your other index finger on the zero, or use these two buttons. You will notice that if you click, uh, the number will increase. And let's just go ahead and do this. Um, just generate a bunch of random numbers and try to generate them as randomly as you can, but let's generate about 100 of them. I'm going to go ahead and generate just a few more. And I'll give you guys the, a couple more seconds so you can do the experiment yourself. So I've almost got about 200 numbers. And you can see the JavaScript slowing down. Hopefully it's not too bad for the Wi-Fi. So I've just generated a bunch of numbers. I, as a human, said, OK, let's 001, 110, 001, 110. And let's see what I've then done. If I scroll down, what I will then see is I will see all these histograms of how often I picked a 1 and how often I picked a 0. But also how often I picked a 0 after a 0 and a 0 after a 1, etc., etc., etc. And what you notice is even though I'm trying to be kind of random, I'm trying to make as many 1s as I am trying to make as many zeros. Uh, you will notice that I usually fall into this pattern where I do a 1 after a 0 and a 0 after a 1. And this is very normal as a human being because it feels random even though it totally isn't. And this small web app, you know, you can read up the map if you want. It tries to do a real-time prediction of what you're going to type in next. And you can also track how often, how good the accuracy is. So if I just reload the page, uh, this will be more of a real-time thing. So 001110001110, not random at all. And uh, then you, at the bottom, you can see that the probability of me being a human, is, uh, me being a robot, is quite low. So, you know. Uh, I, I like this idea of human inference because, in a way, uh, this is an inverse Turing test. By checking if you can actually generate random numbers, I am actually able to say that you are definitely not a computer. Anyway, so this is a sort of way I hopefully real quickly explain to you guys how randomness works and how it doesn't work. Um, it is useful to have some form of randomness available to you, but you as a human simply are not good at generating it. Therefore, we're going to use a computer instead. Another sort of cool thing if you're interested in playing with it. I'm just going to do 001, just repeatedly one after the other. And you see that there's this estimator that tries to predict um, what I'm going to generate next. And you, you'll see that at some point, the probability of me getting a, uh, predicting a one is, you know, first it's a one, then it's a zero, and probably switch. But if I now switch my uh, algorithm, so I'm only going to generate zeros now, you will notice that there's a bit of confusion but after a while, it has picked up my new pattern, and the accuracy goes up again. And if I do only ones now, you'll, do this, you'll see the same pattern as well. The cool thing about this is, because I have these laws of probability to my disposal, I can use a little bit of math to do all of these predictions. But it's still useful to have random samples. So 
um, after this small demonstration, hopefully it's obvious that human entropy generally is quite terrible. This is why we prefer to use a computer to help us think about probability and because we have this computer available to us and because we can sample quite fast, um, we can kind of avoid doing a little bit of math. Because, um, you know, math is hard and even though uh, it is very useful, we do like to just get the job done. So the goal of this talk is to convince you that you can do a lot of these tasks just by getting um, samples instead. And I guess the easiest way to explain sort of from a modeling perspective why samples are useful, um, sometimes we can show, we know the characteristics of a system, but we like to know the likelihood of a certain event happening. And again, it might be easier to use sampling instead of maps to do the inference for us. And the simplest example I could come up with was suppose you have a lot of dice, you roll the dice, and then there's a probability that a certain number of eyes pop out. And I could calculate that, I mean, you know, there's lots of probability. Instead what I could also just go ahead and do is I can draw, uh, like, draw histograms. Um, this is the histogram for if I have one die, this is the histogram for if I have two dice, this is for if I have three dice, et cetera. And I also get this nice probability distribution out that I didn't have to do any math for, I could just sample it. And the nice thing about this is, I can ask this thing two questions. Suppose that I roll four dice, what is the probability of getting a certain number of eyes? This is sort of the sum. But I can also ask it a different question. I can also ask, hey, given this number of eyes, how likely is it that I have been rolling eight dice? I know the rules of the system, I can describe them, and from there on I can sample it. And that means that I don't have to do math, but I can still do inference on these things. So it's sort of, can I look at it from this direction, but I can also look at it from this direction. This is a powerful thing, and this is something that Bayesians tend to like a lot. If you're interested in this kind of sampling, by the way, uh, please consider looking at this library called PyMC3 or this other library called EMC. These sampling methods for inference are very powerful. It's a little bit too theoretical for this talk, but if you're interested, there's a very nice tutorial on my blog which explains how you can do some sort of time series analysis with these sampling tactics as well. Because here I'm just doing inference on dice, but you can do inference on time series as well. But anyway, um, let's consider a fun example of how I actually got better at doing something because I had this computer available and I could do a bit of sampling. Uh, do we know this game? Yes? Uh, do we also always play this game during Christmas where you guys are from? My dad always makes me play this game during Christmas and I absolutely despise the game. I don't see any joy in it whatsoever. So I figured, you know, how about it might be fun if I don't enjoy playing the game, I could at least enjoy beating my dad at it. So the idea would be, can I use sampling a little bit to get better at this game? Because if I think about it, uh, every tile on this board is worth something and I can calculate the expected value if only I knew what the probability was that it would actually land on such a tile. Okay, so math-wise this would be a little bit hard because you have to do a lot of formulas. What I can also just do is I can say, okay, let's just for 10,000 times, I know the rules of the system, I know the rules of the game, I can get that from the web. Let's just have everyone start here and just start rolling dice and use the rules of the game, just check what the long-term probability is that you'll learn, land on a certain tile. There's a very interesting characteristic of this game because the likelihood of being around this corner of the board is quite high because you have this go to jail mechanic. So I did this in a simple way. I didn't include any of the cards, uh, but I did end up with a histogram that looks like this. So at the x-axis you'll see the I, um, sort of the number of the tiles. So this would be tile number zero, this would be tile number uh, 39. And here you can see the likelihood of you landing somewhere. And you'll notice this obvious spike, um, which coincides to be jail here, by the way. But the most interesting thing that you'll notice is after jail, there seems to be a slightly higher likelihood to be at two steps away from jail, four steps away from jail, uh, six, eight, ten, and twelve steps away from jail. And the reason for that is because it's so likely that you get into jail, if you want to get out of jail, you have to roll the same dice twice, which is why it's more likely that you'll land in one of these areas. And if you know that beforehand, you can change your tactic a little bit. For example, and I know there's a lot of randomness in the game, but if I were to choose a station on this board, it becomes, it seems more relevant that I would take this station and that station if I were given the choice. And now I can calculate how much uh, likelihood it is that you actually land there. Reading would be the first station, this would be the second one, this would be the third one, this would be the uh, fourth one. And you can see that it's actually, it's not, you know, twice as likely, but there's a bit of um, bias there, which you can uh, potentially use. And again, this is something I did for the stations. Each station generates the same amount of revenue, but you can scrape monopoly.com or something like that, and you can actually get the amount of money out um, that you can get if you land on one of these places. 
And this is a nice table, which is sort of cool, but then the obvious thing to do is just go ahead and plot this. So for every tile that you can buy, you'll see a point listed here. Uh, this is the probability that you will land on said tile, and this is the rent that you can charge if someone lands on the tile itself. The size of the point would be the expected value. So if the point is very big, that means on average, after every game, uh, the tile will generate more revenue from you. And the thing that you immediately notice is, there seems to be sort of an efficient ISO curve. Like everything on this imaginary line seems to be worthwhile, while down here at the bottom, there's a couple of, you know, not really performing at all uh, spots that you can buy. Can anyone guess which spots those are? It's probably not these. It's probably not these. It would be these, yes, yes. And the two big dots that you saw, those would be these two. The odds of you landing there are quite small, but if you actually land there, boy, are you in trouble. Um, it's sort of the risk bias kind of thing. It's very risky, but you pr there's a lower probability of landing here simply because of the go to jail thing that happened before. And, you know, I'm not drawing it with the, with the points, but you see this pattern also if you've bought a house there and if you bought a second house there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm not saying that I actually got much better at playing this game, um, but uh, I did understand the game a whole lot better, and I did, it didn't really measure how often I won. Um, but I like the fact that just by using a little bit of sampling, I actually understand the game a whole lot better. It's, it's, I know the mechanics of the system, but then I can, you know, collect data by sampling, and then suddenly I understand the game a whole lot better. Uh, it turns out this, uh, this is also on the blog if you're interested, and this blog post was trending on Hacker News for a while, and the kind people on the internet then point out to all the weaknesses of the blog post. Um, there was one guy, and this is sort of the flaw if you're modeling always, I think this is an okay model to start with, but obviously it doesn't encompass everything in the game. So there was one person in particular who was very adamant and said, look, if you want to win, you should buy these places. These are the ones you want to have. And the reason is there's this mechanic in the game that if you buy all the houses first, no one else can buy houses. So if you are the person who actually owns all the houses here, no one can invest in houses on any of these lots, and then suddenly these do become more valuable. And again, like, we, we could go a little bit further, and we could go and, you know, go in depth on how that would work. And a colleague of mine uh, actually built a uh, bit of software around this that you can send your own genetic bots to play this game with a certain strategy. Uh, talk to me after this talk if you're interested. Um, so this was definitely a thing that I thought was fun. Um, I understood the game better, it turned out to be a nice blog post, and it was a nice example of when sampling does something nice. Uh, but there's also, so this is, it's a little bit of a crazy example, but there's um, also some places where in practice I want to make a living and I might actually make a little bit more money if I just do the inference via sampling. And the best example of that, that I have are these Lego minifigures. Uh, are we familiar with Lego minifigures? Just a little show of hands, does everyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, everyone knows what I'm talking about, great. So Legos is a smart company. Uh, Legos at some point realized like, hey, if we combine Star Wars and Legos, they've got two collector's items in one and there will be more people who will be w willing to buy that. So collector's items, you can make a lot of money off it. Uh, this is the original Lego minifigure series and Lego minifigures are kind of like the Kinder Bueno. You open up the packet, but you don't know which Lego minifigure is in there, but there are 16 in the set and after two months or so, they're never gonna produce a set again. So I figured, okay, that sounds interesting. Um, would there be a market for this? So you go to this second-hand website and you scrape a little bit of data and you make a small little histogram because you want to try to see if you supposedly invest in Lego minifigures at the moment, if it will be profitable to sell them later. This is the histogram you would get out, which isn't that pretty because I, I don't really have an impression of what the average price might be. There seem to be a lot around here, but there's a thick tail over there as well. So how do I get a good impression of what the average might be? Okay, so. I'll do a bit of bootstrapping. I say that I have 60 of these prices. I'm just gonna grab 30 at random and calculate the average. I'm gonna repeat that over and over. And that way I get a more smooth curve so I can you know, visually interpret the plot a little bit better. And it turns out if I, this is for the Simpsons Lego minifigures uh, that I was looking at. These are for the other ones. At the time the uh, Simpsons Lego minifigure one was the most recent one. And I can imagine that as the series gets older, it'll be worth more. So, okay, th this might be a good average to look at. Uh, and you shouldn't always look at averages, but this seems reliable enough. So these were the figures that I had. I can buy a Lego minifigure for three euros a piece, and I can sell a full set for a hundred euros later. How likely is it to get the full set? And I was a little bit ignorant. I figured I'd do this with math. And when I say I, I'm gonna do this with math, I'm gonna do this in a programmer's way in math. So you go to math overflow, and you present the question, uh, and then you get this answer back, which is even more 
complicated. Turns out there's this thing called Sterling set numbers, which is, you know, I'm sure it's interesting theory, but I want to solve the problem. So instead of looking at math or even Stack Overflow that comes to the rescue, I should probably just, you know, simulate this. So I did. Here you see the number of packets uh, that I would buy, and the line itself uh, shows the, no, uh, the probability of getting a full set, but the dotted line shows the expected number of total sets that I would have had. Because obviously if I buy 100 packets, the, the odds of getting at least one full set is quite great, but I might actually have two sets. It's sort of rather likely. And again, whenever you're doing these sorts of things, uh, it's always nice to visualize once in a while, because if you visualize something, then you can get surprised. Because when I was looking at this, it sort of made me wonder, gee, if I have one set, and I start collecting even more, from the first set that I collected, I probably have some spare Lego minifigures, which I could probably use to make sure that the second set that I buy is actually uh, easier to collect. So I figured out I'd plot that. I simulated this over and over and over again, and the blue line that you see here, this is again the number of packets. This would be the number of sets that I would have had. This shows the average amount of time that you might need to get one full set. Like, theoretically, you, you need about 50. That seems all right. But the time it takes here is much more than the time it takes here, which in turn is more than the time it takes here, which in turn is more than the time it takes here. So the more Legos I buy, the higher the likelihood is that I'll have more sets. And again, uh, this seems intuitive, but it's because I've done the inference that I was able to figure this out. So again, sampling is very useful. Um, in Amsterdam, I, uh, I often give this course in probability theory, so this seemed like a nice example. Um, I ended up giving this course to a bunch of bankers, and in the latter part of the afternoon, we happily opened one of these boxes to see if the inference was correct. Um, turns out if you open one of these boxes up, um, you will always have three sets. It's not even randomly distributed, but it was still a fun thought exercise. So th these are sort of the obvious use cases when you think of simulation, right? You use simulation because you don't want to do the probability theory. But there's actually other fields than just probability theory that can, you know, get a nice benefit from doing a good simulation exercise. So let's talk about more general use cases and let's talk about optimization in general. And to give the idea of how it works, I'm going to give a slightly silly example. So this is an example where we know the correct answer beforehand. But suppose we have a one by one square and we want to find the largest triangle in this one by one square. And again, this is a very silly example. We know what the largest triangle is. You just, you know, make the diagonal and you're done. But let's say that this is a system that we want to optimize, and the computer has no notion of what the best parameters are. We're interested in finding three points, and the area in between these three points has to be the biggest. That's the only thing that's known to the computer, and the computer doesn't do, know any math further than that. So what's the first thing that you could do? Well, how about we just, you know, generate a whole bunch of random triangles and pick the best one. See how good that works. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. This is sort of the code that you would sort of need. You just generate a whole bunch of random values uh, in six dimensions. So you have x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3. Those would be three points. And then there's this function called the shoelace function, which then calculates what the area between all these points. And you do that for a whole bunch, and you can draw the result. And, you know, the largest triangle will be 0 0.5, and the probability of actually sampling a triangle from this region is rather low, and this doesn't surprise me. So what could we possibly do? Well, what I could do is I could say, gee, um, I have an area, and I have all of these x-coordinates. How about I throw away all the uh, bad triangles that I have? Because I, I can take the average of all the triangle sizes, and I can just throw away the, the halfs at the bottom. I can keep the ones that are on top. And instead of looking at the area, how about a look at the distribution of the points? There is a distribution there. And as luck would have it, um, if you have a sample size that's rather big, what you could do is you could give that to scikit-learn, because scikit-learn has a nice density estimator. So that's what you see visualized here. This is the density plot for the points that are performing well. And to just sort of zoom in a bit, uh, these are, this is x1, x2, and x3, and it seems that if I want to get a good triangle, then either uh, x1, uh, it has to be a low number or a high number, and if x1 is a low number, then x2 has to be a low number as well, or a high number. This coincides with my belief of what a big triangle should be, so that's sort of nice. Not only, if I do this, not only 
can I maybe get a sampling technique that gives me better triangles, but I can understand the problem a bit better as well, just like with Monopoly and just like with the uh, Lego example that I had. And this is what the X and Y uh, distributions look like. Again, on this bigger plot, this is just the X's or the Y's. These are the X's and the Y's together. And what I see sort of makes sense. I like it if my X is smaller than Y, Y be big. That makes complete sense to do like that. All right, so I have this distribution. Let's sample from this one. So the idea is I'm, I'm, I've selected areas that are big. I'm gonna um, sample from that distribution instead. This is what I had before, and if I do a new sample that, I, that I've just learned, I will sample from this distribution instead. And again, what you will notice, it's a lot likelier um, that I'm gonna sample larger triangles. So how about I just repeat this? Sample over, sample over, sample over, sample over. And um, the nice thing is we can repeat the same idea until some sort of convergence pops out. Uh, note that uh, mathematically I've said, hey, we're gonna select the areas that are larger than some, than some, sample, uh, than some M. Um, you could take M to be the average, you could pick whatever other metric, but the cool bonus is that from, if you do an algorithm like this, that we can use inference on our simulated data to learn more about the nature of op optimization problem. And if you're familiar with dynamic algorithms, you may notice that they actually work in a quite similar fashion. Except here I'm trying to look at the distribution of the parameters, whereas a genetic algorithm would use a similar tactic, just do a proper search through the entire grid. Uh, should you be interested in learning more about this, um, there is this colleague of mine, he's sitting there, and he'll talk about this sort of thing more in detail later this week. Uh, specifically, he'll talk about how you can uh, win the board game Risk, or how to conquer the world, as the title would say, it's Thursday, 12 o'clock in a pie term room, and he'll talk more about genetic algorithms in general and how you can apply this to many, many things. Because what you'll probably have noticed as well, this is triangles, but I can uh, sample anything. If it's continuous or discrete, it's just a sampling exercise, which means that I have a very flexible way of optimizing any system. That's not to say that I always find the best solution, but this is a proper way to do a form of search. Hopefully by now, I have convinced you that sampling is indeed useful and it can be a little bit surprising in its use cases. What I'm going to talk about now is sort of my hobby project for the next year, I think, and it's the thing I'm most interested in at the moment, and those, those are generative methods. And the thing that I like about them is they sort of allow you to outsource creativity, and entropy has a small role to play in this. So, so far the distributions have been a little bit static, and in this next bit I'll introduce a little bit more Markovian way to think about randomness. Because so far I've said, here's a distribution, give me a sample, give me a sample. And it wasn't really the case that the sample that I just got determines in a little bit the next sample. Um, this is literally what is listed on my LinkedIn profile. And if you would please spend a little bit of time actually reading it. Some of you may understand the joke. It seems surprisingly relevant nowadays. few people giggle, I'm hoping for a little bit more people to giggle. That's a couple of people understanding the joke. So, if you're on LinkedIn, um, you wanna write down what, what sort of stuff you do. So you write down R, Python, JavaScript, and it's sort of the keyword bingo that everyone plays. Uh, which is, you know, nice, but you get all these nasty recruiters on your profile, which, which you tend to not like. So I figured it'd be fun to just add a couple of Pokemon in there as well. So there's Ditto, uh, Lodash, no, Lodash is actually a thing. Um, <laughs> uh, Vulpix, Git, uh, oh, so again, the main, the main reason is I like to confuse recruiters a bit. I'm a little bit mean, I, I probably shouldn't be, but there's nothing more fun than if a recruiter says, hey, would you come to work for my corporate bank? And then you can then say, well, do you guys use Spark, Hadoop, and Metapod? And, <laughs> and the recruiter says, yes, obviously, we use all the latest technologies. Um, the recruiter in question wouldn't be uh, entirely wrong, right? I mean, uh, recruiters are terrible classifiers for Pokemon. Um, recruiters cannot really distinguish a Pokemon name versus the name of a technology. So I figured making a Python library that can generate Pokemon names might actually be fun. Um, so the library is called Grabble. It's totally not done yet, but the idea is to have tech names for a service. And before you start thinking, gee, that's ridiculous, Vincent, um, speaking of Pokemon as tech names, there's this uh, GitHub repo. Turns out that a lot of people have used Pokemon names for their original GitHub projects. Um, there's a link in the uh, you know, presentations if you want to look at it later, it'd be fine. But uh, Metapod is actually a, it's not necessarily a big data technology, but it's a template-based robot dynamics library. Uh, and there's this lovely little web page that for every 750-ish Pokemon uh, tells, gives you a link to GitHub with a, uh, you know, name of a Pokemon in the package. Anyway, uh, back to serious stuff. Um, 
The reason why I want to make Gravel is I've always been a user of libraries, but I've never really written one myself, and the problem seemed interesting enough. Um, I will most likely learn from doing this, so uh, I'll probably write like a Twitter bot someday that's sort of called Tanas Tech Names as a Service or something. Um, but so the idea is to generate names that sound like Pokemon. And to put it bluntly, the whole point of Gravel is to come up with a better name. And then I started thinking about it. Okay, so I have these, I want to generate Pokemon names. That seems like an interesting problem. Um, but it involves generating a believable sequence of tokens. And when you think about it, I could do this for Pokemon names, but there are many other things I could do as well. Like Red Hot Chili Pepper lyrics. Or Ikea furniture names. Or notes on a piano. Um, so the simplest model that you could possibly then think of is say, okay, suppose I have some token. I will, this is independent of if it's a letter in a, in a word, or if it's a word in a sentence, or if it's a MIDI note in an entire arrangement, or if it's, um, you know, a, a, a sound in a, a IKEA furniture. Um, but the idea is once I know the previous token, I might have some other probability distribution for the next token. That's sort of what Markovian thinking is all about. Depending on the state that I am in now, I will sample from a different distribution for my next token. And this is the simplest model. Um, if I see the letter A beforehand, uh, probably the chance of seeing another vowel should be somewhat smaller and seeing a consonant might be somewhat larger. Um, but you can also do it not just for the last token, but the token before that as well. This sort of generating a Markov chain that you're gonna learn and then you're gonna try and walk it. And sort of the basic way of doing it is to say, okay, I have this Markov chain, it, I can look forward. Uh, maybe I look back a bit as well. So if I'm generating the third token, I should look at the second token and the first one. So it's a, a Markov chain of rank two in this sense. Um, but if you really wanted to, this is just a way of thinking about it. Um, if I know T1, then the distribution for T2 is set. It's sort of the sampling rule, if you will. But who says it has to be ordered in one direction? I can also model this in a way that you can model it from two directions. Because if you think about it, the, um, it seems fine to start with the first letter of the Pokemon name, because there's a like, prior belief that you could start with a certain letter, but there's probably a different distribution for the last letter as well. So it doesn't seem entirely unsensible that Pokemon probably don't end with the letter I, for example. So maybe we shouldn't have a Markov chain that goes one way, but a Markov chain that goes both ways in. It seems rather sensible, and it's sort of the same probabilistic model. So I'm playing around with this, so I'd just like to give you a preview. Uh, here are some Pokemon names I came up with. Uh, Lido, Keen, Cool, uh, Rhesus, Pule, uh, Uktkata, Util, I especially like Util for some reason. Uh, Olma, Elitip, uh, so these seem rather plausible. The Red Hot Chili Pepper results are just hilarious. Uh, can you believe, hold me please, by the way, I wonder what the wave meant. White Heat is screaming in the nearest bin. When I was fortunate, I know you must have been fat this year. Eat the sun at a bottom dollar. Foxhole love pie in your house. Then let me spin feather light, but you can't move this. <laughs> and the, the, the sort of the, the lovely joy of doing things like, like making these sorts of models isn't that this is accurate, but it is somehow accurate. Like I, I, I somehow do believe that this came from Red Hot Chili Peppers and let's say not Blink-182 or something like that. Uh, what you also sort of notice is that the corpus, was, the, the corpus of the Red Hot Chili Pepper lyrics is somewhat limited. So if I say, by the way, which is obviously always going to be together, what the wave meant, I think, was also like literally in one of their songs. So the corpus does have some influence, but this sort of works, and that's exciting. Same thing for IKEA furniture. Uh, like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I would definitely like to have a Ripe couch or a uh, Yerbs uh, thing. Unico, oh, yeah, so the, so the problem. Okay, so the, the reason why this happened was I was talking to my girlfriend about this problem over dinner, and she was obviously not super impressed. Uh, <laughs> like, really, Vincent, you're spending your time on this. Uh, instead of making Pokemon names, how about you make IKEA furniture names? I was like, that's an excellent idea. Um, anyway, um, the thing is, the, I've just shown you the nice bits. A lot of these are actually quite wrong. I mean, uh, these were a lot of samples that didn't really make the cut. Um, so I really think A is a terrible name for furniture or a Pokemon. Um, day also seems a bit odd. And, and <laughs> Ia, <laughs> which I think is also still a various one. So there's, there's still work to be done. And um, just sort of to explain how I'm thinking about maybe tackling the problem and some stuff I learned from just thinking about this. Um, in the machine learning community, it's very normal to make ensembles of models. Instead of just making one model, how about you make 10 of them and combine them in some way? Because it seems sensible that if this model s works somehow, but this one works also, but in a slightly different way, you should be able to combine them. And the laws of probability certainly allow for this. So that seems like a thing I could do to make this better. 
Another thing that I could do is my library has this notion of a lexicon, which is sort of like a data frame, and a model will be like a model, but instead of having a data frame, you need some sort of uh, bag for sequences of tokens. What I could also do is say, hey, here I've got this lexicon with all the Pokemon names, train it. Here I've got this lexicon of the English language, because maybe I want to have Pokemon that actually sound English. And then I could go ahead and combine the two, and then these would be two models that aren't just two different models, but they're also trained on different data, but they can actually you know, be glued together to maybe uh, get better sequences. Uh, it's a very fun experiment in my, in my mind to generate Pokemon names that sound French or Pokemon names that sound German. Um, what I could also do is maybe do something with a transcriber or some form of transducer. In the Pokemon names, it, it seems very obvious that instead of just focusing on this letter came after that letter, I might actually give some domain knowledge and say, this letter happens to be a consonant, and the odds of getting three consonants after each other is rather low. So then I would translate uh, sort of as a mapping uh, the lexicon to something else and train another model that coincides. This seems like a viable tactic because you can sort of do extra domain knowledge in your model this way. What you can also do is you can try to add judges. Um, how about I generate 100 samples on this one that was based on this one model, and I have this other model that would judge this model. So from the 100 samples, I will sort them all and maybe take the top 10. This also seems like an appropriate way of thinking about it. Uh, I can also think more, uh, this would be sort of hardcore, but you can also think about it not in a uh, Markovian way, but maybe just generate a factor graph instead. This has some nice benefits. And maybe we can even take this Levenstein-ish approach where I start out with a Pokemon name and one by one, randomly, I change a letter. Also a way to generate something that should be sounding plausible. And the nice thing about doing it this way is I'm not necessarily limited to just probability theory, but I can use Jensen's word to vec algorithm here. And then you can sort of wonder, hey, uh, what a word is in a sentence, there's some context there, but what would a letter in this, like a token in a sequence be? It's also sort of an interesting way. Like we can have like token to vec. Uh, we can also consider these deep models, which is uh, fashionable nowadays. And the way that would work is you would say, I have a start token and I have some prior beliefs, so generate that. I'm gonna sample all the way down until I see some sort of stop token. Uh, this is nice, but it has some sort of, I have some features that I would like to have, which uh, this way of thinking doesn't necessarily support. Um, suppose I wanna generate a Pokemon name with six letters, and I know the second one and the sixth one. How am I gonna generate the others? This is, a, this, is, this is what makes the problem hard, so I'm not sure if I wanna give support to this, but if you are a deep learning specialist, or think you are, and you know the solution to this, please come talk to me. I'd love to hear what you think about it. So I will focus on the following domains. Probabilistic graphical models seem all right. Heuristic approaches seem all right, and deep learning seems all right. It's very interesting to see how the fields are converging, because uh, nowadays you can use a neural net as a generative algorithm, which takes some sort of Gaussian in and generates some sort of generated distribution out. This is from the uh, Op uh, OpenAI page. It's, uh, it's got some lovely, uh, research on projects like this. And the rough API plan, which is sort of the main lesson that I had as I was designing this, instead of just writing code in a notebook, it seems like a better idea that before you write any actual code, um, you should wonder what does the UI look like? I'm gonna be the user, I'm gonna be you know, using this a lot. I have different lexicons, I have different models I'd love to train. What's the best way for me as a user to play around with this? So what you then do is just copy scikit-learn. Um, the, there's some notion of a data frame, and I just call it a lexicon. There are these different models, so let's say I have a factor graph, a two-way Markov chain, etc. This is what defines the properties of the models, and I can later fit that on a separate lexicon. Uh, once those models are trained, I can generate from them, and the hopeful idea is that I can somehow make a ensemble based on two different models, maybe even give them some weighting, uh, and then use, uh, and then sort the, the outcome of this by some sort of judging characteristic of a model. Simply by writing this down for myself, it's not even working yet, this made it a lot clearer for me to know what I should be building and how I should be designing things. And then hopefully, maybe by the end of uh, next year, I can come back and talk about a model that can make Pokemon names where you say, hey, I don't know this token, I don't know that one, and I don't know that one, but I want the token to end with base. Especially in the market for making uh, uh, tech names, it seems very, very useful to do stuff like this. Um, another thing that's interesting, so this is uh, sort of the deep neural dreaming dream of building something that works for tokens, but it works for art as well. Um, this is actually something that doesn't use any entropy, but this is something that you can uh, generate fairly easily in just a couple of lines in JavaScript. And if you're interested, uh, if you're gonna come on Friday to my Blender talk, we'll make pretty images sort of like this, but in 3D. That will be the goal of that talk. We'll just use simple cubes, and if you're interested, come talk to me. Uh, we're gonna build pretty stuff that looks like this. So, concluding. Assembly can be a whole lot of fun and sometimes actually profitable. Lego example. 
Getting started is super easy. You might actually be surprised on how often it can help you out. Uh, again, people don't necessarily always understand PyMC3 because it's a little bit less straightforward on the uh, theory side, but you're very, very flexible. You can just describe a system and sample away, and you can actually solve a whole lot of problems. Python is a great use case language for this. Uh, it's actually surprisingly easy to be very flexible with just a couple of lines of code. Um, and it's actually quite fast as well. I mean, NumPy is great. Um, and if you're ever considering um, thinking about an API, this is something I kind of learned from the R community. Um, try to optimize for joy. You're going to be using the library maybe, and then it might be better to spend an entire day thinking about what the API would be like, such that it would be the most fun to start using the library. Instead of having a mountain you should climb in order to become a pro in the language, maybe we should have this pit that you just fall into and you're immediately a pro. Thanks for listening. Okay. I'd be time. happy to take any questions, but anything Pokemon related that's not about the game, you can also just talk to me in private when I'm outside somewhere. Any Re questions? No questions. Uh, there's one person in the back there, I think, with a white shirt, I believe. I'm not wearing my glasses. Uh, also, if you've done something similar to this, also come talk to me. This is sort of a hobby project, but I'd be happy to hear if someone else had done something similar. Hey, okay. um, my question is. Um, Can you speak up a little bit? Yes, yeah, so yeah. my question is. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's an appropriate question, but if you had to simulate a network of queues, yes, so you have a queue and a queue, yeah. um, how would you do that? So that there's two queues next to each other. Uh, let's say there's a network, yeah, then maybe there's like yeah, three so of the, them. Um, in. So in the use case for MIDI, this is definitely a problem, right? Because if you're doing a MIDI track for, so Pokemon names, and this is a toy example, those are easy. The, the main gist of what I'm trying to get to at some point is this would be interesting for music, but music would be more difficult because then, let's say you have the bass that's playing, you have the drums that, that's playing, and then you have the, the melody, for example. Then you have three sequences that actually have to correlate somehow, um, but in this case don't really fit into this model. Um, what you could do then is, uh, th there's a couple of libraries that have a bit of support for this, but you kind of have to go into probabilistic graphical modeling in that way. Um, the trick is to then say, there's, there's two tricks you could do. There's one trick where you can say, these are three tokens that I can see as one separate token, and that will go into this one list, and I will try to generate that. Um, this can be, you, you might need a lot of data before you actually get the pattern right, so that's a little bit expensive in a way. The other way is to not have the complexity in the data, but add the complexity to the model where you just say, hey, these are three time series and they're somehow correlated, learn that. Uh, and you could do that with a sampling approach. PyMC3 has some examples of that. Uh, but then you get into sort of correlated time series land. Um, I, if, if I have like a whiteboard, I can more easily explain that to you, so come to me afterwards if that's something you're interested in. But it, it is sort of doable. It's just hard. Anyone else? Yes? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, that's a, that's a good question. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the question is, hey, this is a nice talk, but um, obviously when you have more dimensions, this would be harder, right? Uh, so for the triangle example, that's reasonably easy because there's only six dimensions. Uh, and you'd be right. <laughs> Um, so the dimensionality is always an issue, right? Uh, and I believe, uh, I'll just grab the picture. So the, uh, suppose we had this, but in uh, 12,000 dimensions. Obviously it's a whole lot harder. Uh, what I would be more t uh, saying here is consider this as a approach. It actually has a couple of useful use cases and you can actually solve some things with it. But especially in the optimization field where you have like lots of hills and many, many dimensions, um, the reason why we use genetic algorithms is be that's because of the best thing we have, not necessarily because that's the best thing we could have. Uh, when you go into random algorithms land, you do that because um, there's no alternative. There's greedy methods, but those have downsides too. Yep. So uh, I didn't quite get what was, why couldn't you do like an LSTM? Ah. So the, the thing with the LSTM is usually you can say, hey, generate lots and lots of sequences. The um, issue I sort of have is with this one use case. So suppose that you say I want to have a Pokemon that starts with an H, 
then an A, and then after three tokens comes a P. All right, so you want like... Yes, I, and I, I, I wanted to finish sequences. But can't you like just plug in a bunch of Pokemon names and just sort of see what comes out? Come, uh, one more time? Like can't you just like just plug in a bunch of Pokemon names and then see what comes out at the uh, other I, end? And, and, and I have, but then the thing is, um, Suppose I, I stream all the Pokemon names in, right? So Pokemon right. name, Pokemon name, it's learning, it's learning, the internal state is there. Then usually how you would generate a new sequence would be to say, here's a start token, go. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it's gonna sample an end token and then it's done, then it has a Pokemon name. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. I could do is I could say, generate a whole lot of them until at some point you have a Pokemon name that starts with an H, then an A, then three tokens, whatever, and then a P. But that feels like oversampling a bit. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, so th 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 this is more of an open problem. I've, um, it's, it's very fun to go to academic conferences and ask this to professors. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, th th there should be a sort of more genetic, sort of more neural way to also approach this problem. And that's why the, uh, the generative thing from OpenAI, where you actually add the entropy yourself, seems like a worthwhile venture. Um, it's just that I've never really heard anyone say, here's an obvious solution to this problem. Mm. And is it, mm. in, like, <laughs> if it's not the most important problem in the world either, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm not, you know, too angry sure. about that. Sure. Thank you. Okay, let's give a big round of applause for Vincent Wagmerdam. Thanks.